So we've identified which circuits are contributing to the electric field exposure. And just park this straight between his toes. Do you have any toe <laughs> When we're getting macro doses of these toxic metals uh, and elements, Now we're looking at 51, 50. Now we're looking at 6,000. 6,000 microvolts, so. It's actually what kills most people, uh, the inflammatory process. But... And then you can see there are two LEDs and one receiver. The room has already been shielded with a shielding paint. That's grounded, so that's going to catch one of those electric fields from the wiring. We will bump into it occasionally, not often, but I can guarantee you, you bump into it. Welcome everybody, thank you for tuning in. Today we'll be talking about radio frequency radiation. G'day everyone, uh, this is Gordy David. Uh, I've got Patrick uh, Vanderberg. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> uh, who's a uh, specialist in, uh, I guess, radiation and uh, uh, EMF action uh, and how I came across Patrick was uh, I was uh, looking for hemp house building and um, I don't know exactly how I found it but somehow in hemp house and I found uh, your company partnered with a hemp builder uh, to produce not only a hemp house but a house that shielded its uh, residents from uh, EMFs and radiation. I thought that was quite an ex interesting innovation, given that there's a lot of concern right now about uh, EMFs and, uh, and all the uh, health hazards that those cause. And uh, so I've learned that you're, uh, you've, been, you've been in the business for some 40 some odd years. So I'm not too, so, I guess what's an interesting thing would be to find out when did you get it? What got you into uh, uh, protecting yourself against EMS and all? That? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, tell me a bit about how you ended up creating GeoVital. Yeah, sure. So, um, GeoVital, I'm, I'm the the um, senior managing par senior managing partner for GeoVital International, which means that I look after. GeoVital's interest, they're a, they're a naturopathic health clinic based in Austria who, through the work with patients, basically ended up being a specialist in environmental medicine, which is really what we're doing. We're, we're helping people, especially with chronic health issues, sometimes more serious, uh, you know, even terminal, terminal issues, to create healthier sleeping environments because uh, nighttime when you sleep, that's when the body rests and regenerates, or is supposed to. And um, yeah, upon closer inspection, the average bedroom is terrible um, because we have a lot of irritation, especially from our electrical systems that we have in our house, which produce low level radiation, which just doesn't leave us alone. And so GeoVital has been doing that for, uh, for nearly 40 years now. And uh, it's set based in Austria originally, and I look after their interest for outside Europe. Um, I've been involved in this for around about 10 years. Um, my uh, partner at the time had a um, uh, a brain cancer and um, yeah, that wasn't looking all so good. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy sort of backfired and it was proven to not be an option. And um, um, yeah, we were sort of forced to go complementary and alternative approaches to cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then you start looking at it. it doesn't take very long to come across this term EMF radiation. And um, yeah, there's a lot and a lot of research about this. And um, so we started delving into that. And, um, you know, amongst other things, we, we did some sort of energetic uh, therapies like uh, bioresonance therapies and uh, ionized oxygen therapy, a few different things, but especially also looking after the environment, optimizing that sleep, because that's where your body, your body is amazing. Your body can recover so well. And we, we know intuitively that a body does that because when you have a virus, when you don't feel well, where do you want to go? You want to go and have a nap, right? You want to go to bed. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the body does the fixing. But the average bedroom is, is shocking. There's, I mean, we can talk about this, but we have, 
you know, we have wiring in the walls, which emits an electric field just because there's voltage there. You might not be using one cent of electricity, but you've got this relentless electric field comes out about two meters, six foot, um, in, out, in, out, 50, 60 times per second, you know, depending on which country you're in. And it just interferes with your cells, your cells of electrical receptors. And we just, we just can't expect them to operate optimally under those circumstances. And then, of course, we've got radio frequency radiation. You know, everybody's worried about the new networks that just get launched every two years, right? I mean, at the moment, it's 5G. Don't worry, they're already working on 6G. Um, forget about them. I mean, we've already got studies. We have no studies on 5G, right? Nobody has any studies on 5G. But we have studies on 3G and 4G, right? Lower frequencies, less power, and they're already showing that we've got massive problems with it. There's studies where, you know, one side of town is more affluent, has more money, and there's more towers there to have better coverage. And the poorer side of town has less cell phone towers, less coverage, less radiation. There's more cancers on that side of the river than there is on that side of the river. And it's not the only study. There are there are, uh, I did an interview, I have a podcast channel, it's called Health Stronghold, you can find it on iTunes and Stitcher and all that sort of stuff. And on there you'll find an interview I did with a uh, Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe from the UK. Um, and she's been on the campaign path for the last 10 years to try and educate other doctors about this issue and the research that's available. And in her words, there are 20,000 plus peer reviewed, meaning quality, research studies on the health effects of low-level radiation exposure from things like Wi-Fi, cell phone towers, um, electricity. And the majority, the majority of those 20,000 studies indicate harm. Now, all these studies look at a tiny little piece of the information. One might look at how the cells react. One might look at the uh, immune system response. One might look at the blood-brain barrier and how it's allowed to let more chemicals into your brain when you're exposed to radio frequency radiation. Um, every study looks at a little subsection of the entire study, but there's so much research out there that yeah, the way she argued rightfully that any doctor looking at that, everybody would have to come to the same conclusion. We have a problem here. And you know, doctors, um, scientists that are speaking out, there's been appeals to the UN, and just it's all just falling on deaf ears because there's just so much uh, money um, tied up into this whole telecommunication uh, system. And you know, it, it is hard to go without it. You know, we need it for work, we need all these sorts of things. And whilst, you know, I don't wanna, you know, sort of you know, spread paranoia about the subject either. Um, we, we should have less of it. There's absolutely no, no argument about that. We should have less of it. But the good news in the whole story is that your body rests and regenerates whilst you sleep. And your sleeping environment, you have a large amount of control over in terms of what you are exposed to. It doesn't matter if it's an existing house, house you're building, house you own, house you're renting. If it's a tiny house you're constructing, an extension on, onto the house. You have a large amount of control, and and yeah, that that's what we help people with. So it's really funny we get well, not funny, funny, but you know we get lots of people with serious things that you know their lives is affected by miscarriages, cancers, just chronic health issues that you know our society is just you know, um, constantly bombarded with and, and and just drags on. And doctors, doctors are trained to deal with end stage diseases, whatever, everything that comes through the door now, or a lot of, it's all this, 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 this dwindling problem with health issues, blood pressure problems, and, and anyway, there's, there's so many links to all this sort of stuff, and I can go on for hours, but there's research on uh, radio frequency radiation from cell phone towers being linked to diabetes markers in, in school kids, and, and the exposure they were talking about, I see that much more of that all the time. And that's their daytime exposure. That's not even the nighttime exposure. So the, the list just goes on and on and we have a, a massive problem. And, and so that's what we sort of specialize in. We go to people's houses. I also train people to be consultants. And we go to people's houses and we find all these common problems. 
and then we, in verifiable ways, we help to mitigate those. So there's no, no, no crystals or dream catchers or miraculous devices that, well, put this in your house and your house is neutralized, harmonized, balanced, all those sorts of vague terms. Um, we only work with verifiable solutions. So if we have a meter, we can measure the radiation the way it is to begin with. And when we're finished, it should be significantly less. Um, and uh, yeah, we're doing the best job possible, best possible products to achieve the best possible results. And then, yeah, it's kind of a weird industry to be in. And then it's fingers crossed and, and see what that does, that you've created a healthier environment for people is uh, obviously plain and easy to see. But um, in terms of how that translates in relation to the health issues, that is something you have to wait for, you know, as in do the symptoms start disappearing? Sometimes they do almost immediately. Sometimes it takes much longer. Sometimes it wasn't the problem. You still have a healthy bedroom, but the symptom might stay. I guess, you know, even a doctor can't guarantee or promise that they'll heal you either. You know, it's the body that does the healing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, we just keep doing the right thing the long way around <laughs> with the best approach and, and uh, you know, uh, things that make sense. And yeah, something I'm passionate about and that, you know, that's why I'm so keen to talk with you today as well, is that, you know, if, if, if in construction, if, if we can incorporate those avoidance strategies, so we're not exposed to radiation, and we can talk about a few of those uh, later if you like. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, if we can avoid it, if we can make little changes in our approach, maybe incorporate some products to help shield us against this, which is so much easier to implement when you're building it rather than trying to do it later, um, yeah. then it's a wonderful opportunity to not just build something that suits your lifestyle, but it actually protects you and your family when you're inside of it. And that just makes a lot of sense. And that's something I'm very passionate about. I, I help people build houses as in you know, complete structures over here, we're involved with commercial projects, apartment buildings. Um, you know, I, I help people internationally. I've got a house built with me in the Bahamas. I was hoping wow. to go for a side visit, but that didn't happen. Um, but I, it's something I'm very uh, passionate about because I, I think it's it's really important to to you know when we have the opportunity to do it better, we should. So I mean, it seems like uh, a lot of the work really fo seems to be focused around the bedroom. So that's. And that's probably why um, that's where, like you said, that's where all the healing happens. So the, the, a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, were talking about what what can you do in the bedroom to uh, to make your your bedroom healthier. I know I know the the bed is the bed is of course one of those things, but uh, also there's been talk about um, the the various say paints that you can put on the walls. And I suppose there's other things you can do to shield yourself against the uh, the wired parts of your bedroom, and I suppose uh, just the exposure to uh, the microwaves, the radio waves. Um, what are some of the things that you, speaking, end up doing to hit people's houses? I suppose you have to do an inspection first. So, wh what do you usually do first when you go into, a, say, a bedroom? Yeah. So. It's a little different between an, an existing home and a home you're building, um, which is when you think about it, a little bit odd, maybe. But when you go into an existing house, you tend to investigate for the problems that could be there and what is there you mitigate against or you, you, you try and fix and address. When we're building a house or we're building a tiny home, um, then, you know, well, you, you know that you're going to have a problem with the wiring. And I, I can go over those different radiation types. We might as well. So. <clears throat> so you know you're going to have a problem with the wiring, so you'd want to fix that. But for example, in terms of cell phone tower radiation, right? If you're building a house, it's going to be finished in a year and a half from now, right? And so our exposure could be totally different then. So a lot of people we're involved with that are building houses, when it comes to shielding against like radio frequency radiation from cell phone towers, they just implement it, regardless of what the levels are. Because, you know, when you realize it, you know, this stuff only ever gets worse. Um, so, and it's easy to implement it now. So they tend to just, all right, just, let's just put it in. You know, if, if we don't strictly speaking need it today, we'll probably need it three years from now. So let's just future proof the house. Um, and it's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. But in an existing home, people tend to fix what's there. Sometimes people say, listen, 
um, I want to do this and this and this anyway, even though it's not strictly speaking necessary. Um, and I don't have to get you to come back two, three years from now to check if the levels have changed. We, we've got things you know, taken care of. So what sort of radiation types are you looking at or what are we concerned about? So basically you could say you could separate them in two groups. So you've got radiation types related to electricity and then you've got the radiation associated with um, transmitters, um, phone towers, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, airport navigation, um, radar, all the sort of stuff that travels through the air without wires. That's radio frequency radiation. And then we have electricity on the other end. So electricity, of course, all our houses have electricity. Uh, there are some people that go as far as to go to you know, battery operated houses having 12 volt DC, which from a biological perspective is great, but you know, of course it's tricky to just plug any appliance in that you're used to using. So it's a little tricky to maybe live that way. And you don't need to make it that difficult. You can deal with normal electricity quite well. So why, when it why comes is to- a, Why is battery, why would you say battery would be better than, so DC is safer than AC, is that right? In some way? Yeah, because um, AC, alternating current, no such thing exists in nature, mm. right? Our bodies operate on DC, on oh. direct current. Your nervous system communicates with DC, you know, the impulses in your brain. Um, AC doesn't exist. Your body doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to interpret a signal it gets, which is AC, it's completely foreign. So at the very least, forget about, you know, what it can harm and what the research shows, you know, the, the risks are of it. At the very least, it's a stress signal that your body just doesn't know what to handle with and, and, and you know, it starts putting the defenses up. And that's why, for example, in the average bedroom, because we have all this electric field exposure from the wiring that's sitting inside your wall. And, and don't worry, if you're listening to this, uh, I'm happy to put a hundred bucks down, you know, if we had a bet um, that in your bedroom, there's a 95% chance that you've got electric field exposure inundating you. You know, take my word for it. I mean, we just see it every single bedroom nearly, unless you have concrete construction, then it might not be so bad. But if you've got a brick veneer house, normal wiring in the wall, chances are you've got constant irritation. And in our industry, we see this electric field exposure as one of you know, the, 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 the biggest impact on your sleep quality, you know, even just from the fact that your body just doesn't know what to do with the signal and is stressed by it. Um, so, so your wiring is a problem. So electricity produces electric fields just from having voltage present and it can produce magnetic fields and magnetic fields are caused by current the flow of electricity so electricity needs to be used for magnetic fields to be generated now i don't want to get too technical and and as you mentioned um, um, you know we have a, a course on how to incorporate radiation free building uh, techniques in an in a, in a extension or in a tiny home mm -hmm. uh, where we go into much more detail also about electricity and stuff. But effectively, when you have a, an, an, an active cable or a hot or a phase, depending which country you're from, you have a different name for it. So the, the, the cable that the power comes in, right, gets used by the light bulb or whatever it is you're using, and then it comes back on the neutral. And both of those cables will produce a magnetic field, but it'll be in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And because those cables are close together, that magnetic field nicely cancels itself out. So normally in a house, normal wiring, when you're running things, you don't tend to have magnetic fields in the house unless you, you, know, you have a little um, EMF meter and you measure right on top of the cable, then you'll get a rise out of it. But as soon as you back off, it's, it basically disappears. Now that works as long as it's properly installed and there's no errors in the, in the way it was installed because if mistakes are made, the returning current can split over different neutral cables and then the flow of current is out of whack and then we get enormous magnetic fields inside a house and you're sitting nicely between the cables, which is exactly the wrong position, a very high exposure. So normally magnetic field exposure is something that comes from outside. That's the transmission lines that we're probably all aware of and most people would go, hmm, don't think if that's such a good idea to live close to those. Um, but it's more so, or more frequently, uh, the transmission lines are a problem, absolutely. And there's lots of research on those. But the, the local distribution lines that are running up and down your street, those are the ones, when we visit people, those are the ones that we most frequently 
are confronted with, they produce magnetic fields that reach within the property because we tend to be close to them. Underground is better, but not for magnetic fields. They'll still come out if there's a, uh, an indifference in the, in the current that's flowing. And of course, you know, as you know, a lot of homes traditionally have the master bedroom at the front of the house. Yeah. And yeah, that's often a bad idea. You kind of want to more position that back or move the building back if you had the space for it. Wow. Um, so, but yeah, magnetic fields you can't shield against. So um, you know, that's something I would teach to, to look at the positioning of a house or positioning of an extension you might be planning. Um, and when it comes to a tiny house, when you're moving it and you're, you're picking a position for however long it's going to be there, um, then it's handy to have one of those Gauss meters handy where you can actually assess where you're going to park this thing for the next months or you know however the time period is so you don't position yourself in a bad spot you could move it 14 meters or, or even 10 meters in a different direction have completely different readings which would be far more supportive to your health than parking it in the wrong spot um, so yeah so magnetic fields electric fields is something we deal with um, in terms of the electric fields um, as this is almost always a problem First of all, we can go for shielded cable. Mm. If that's a free tip for you to pick up on, on today, that's yeah. it. If you're building a tiny house, forget about normal electrical cable. Get shielded cable instead. Mm. Um, shielded cable is about three times the price. Of course. Of course. Which, which an electrician might say, oh, that's expensive for cable. Yeah, I know. But how much cable can you have in a house, right? It's compared to the whole project. It's so minor. It's not yeah. funny. Yeah. So forget about normal cable. You want to go for shielded cable which has a jacket around the cables that are sitting inside. And this jacket is connected to ground. And that's where electric fields want to go. So when the wire, when the voltage produced the electric fields, it's immediately caught by the sheeting uh, and led away. So the wiring no longer emits um, electric fields into the space. Now, of course, when you, you, know, uh, when you electrify an, an extension or have electricity in a house, or if you have a tiny home and you plug it into the power supply that, you know, from the people you park next to that you're using, or if you're in a camping area and you use their power, of course, you're just like any other house. You also have the, the normal electricity on the inside. When you plug things into your outlets, into your power points, your plugs, um, of course, the appliances you plug in, they will still emit the electric field. So shielded cable is a logical ch choice to go for cables, but it's not the only um, answer to the to the issue either so there's, there's other strategies that you can incorporate there's special switches that can cut the power to a section or a circuit of your construction when you don't require power there so at night when the lights go off and you're not using any anything anymore the power can be cut sometimes automatically depending on which country you are and what switches are available and sometimes we have remote controlled units that press the button that section of the house gets deprived of electricity and anything plugged in would then also not be emitting the electric field so those are very beautiful verifiable ways to to remove that as a burden and it has a, a big impact on people's sleep sometimes noticeably um sometimes not noticeably um yeah so, in, in theory it all makes sense to to of course create the healthier bedroom it's so you great if you can feel it but otherwise you're still doing a great job with it so you know how a lot of uh, in australia a lot of the switches have like on off right at the uh at the socket is would simply just turning those off at night would that help decrease uh the the exposure it it would <clears throat> if you flick the switch at the socket, which a lot of countries don't have, by the way, but ours right. do. Uh, if you flick it off at the circuit, you would deprive electricity from entering the cable that goes into your appliance. So right. let, let's imagine that this is a bedside lamp, for yeah. example. Yeah. So you'll, you'll have your plug, then you'll have a stretch of cable, yeah. and then there'll be a switch, right? Yeah. That's where you normally turn your light on. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's a bit inconvenient to have to reach behind your bedside table to try and get to this switch on the wall. So you use the little switch on the cable itself. Mm. So when you got the light off, mm. Mm. the cable to the switch still has voltage in it. And so that's where a problem is. And you'd be horrified how much you get just of that cable. If you had shielded cable inside the wall and you just plug that in, you'll be horrified to see what that still puts on somebody's body. 
Um, but by flicking off that switch it, it, at the wall, yeah. you deprive that electricity from going to the switch of your light. Okay. So that's a big plus. Oh, so so if you point. have shielded cable in the wall, mm -hmm. then by terminating it at that point, then you should basically have your electric fields under control. If you have normal cables in the wall, it's nice to turn it off, but by no means, in my experience, by no means are you getting anywhere near to creating a healthy sleeping environment. The wiring in your wall is a massive problem um, that you know, creates you know, a lot of electric field, regardless if you've got something plugged in or not. So, so wait, so that the, even the switch is off at the, at the socket, then it won't have it won't be generating any electrical fields or are you saying it would still generate electrical fields if you flick it off at the power point at the outlet then no electric electricity okay. yeah. is able yeah. to go into the cable to your appliance if right. that's a bedside right. lamp it's a radio alarm clock which are terrible and, and often cause headaches anyway yeah get rid of them regardless um could be a washing machine whatever you got plugged in so when you flick that off, yeah. that's yeah. a good idea because then there's no voltage in there. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is that if you, if we're talking about your house that you already live in, mm. um, if you have normal wiring inside the wall, yeah. Yeah. flicking that switch to your bedside lamp is going to have very little effect. Okay. It's a good habit, but you get so much from the wall already wow. that okay. you're hardly scratching the surface, so oh, to speak. Really? If you have shielded cable in the house, if you have shielded cable in the house, um, then um, 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 then the wiring won't be emitting electric fields. So then, if you flick off the um, the supply to that appliance, then um, uh, then you've basically got it under control because you're getting no more electric fields from the wiring in the wall and no more electric fields from the appliance. Is there is there um... Because I'm sure you uh, talk about the term the Faraday cage concept. <clears throat> is there is there uh, a way to mit so you know rewiring an entire existing house could be quite a quite a job. Um, is there a way? Is like uh, we were talking about paint, or we we haven't talked about it, but using different paints, or could you use things like uh, putting say al on the on the walls or or something like that would that actually shield um uh someone from the electrical fields also depend depends on what you use so um so when it comes to just to recap so magnetic field there's not much you can do about it if you're exposed so the tactic is to avoid exposure yeah. um, and if there's something that's producing magnetic fields within your house it shouldn't do that, so it needs to be investigated, needs to be fixed. Electric fields, you would want to have shielded cable instead, yeah. but if yeah. you if they're already in place, and it's of course costly to rip everything out and start new when it's already there, um, those cutoff switches that we have access to, they can cut the power to a circuit when it's not in use, yeah. um, which especially again at night is important. And then it wouldn't matter if you've got anything plugged in, if you're not using power, there won't be any voltage. Um, when it comes to radio frequency radiation, so that's things from cell phone towers, radar, airport navigation, Wi-Fi, um, there's different solutions for that. So we invented um, shielding paint, which is um, a paint with a high graphite and carbon content. Uh, of course, the thing to remember is that we're originally a naturopathic health clinic. So we have long-term relationships with our, uh, with our patients. And so for us to have a product or something that sort of helps you, but not really in the long term, that doesn't work for us, right? We, we need to maximize the opportunity to get the results with the patients. And then if we help them with radiation, we don't want to put ingredients in it either that become a burden on a whole different level, right? It needs to be a holistic approach. And so we were very careful in crafting this products called T98. Um, and so it's basically graphite and carbon. It's a very low VOC paint, so it's a very healthy paint. Um, and we you know, avoided many ingredients, which other manufacturers wouldn't think twice about letting in, uh, but we avoid those. So talk about, VO um, talk about, I mean, I know what VOCs are, but uh, like the volatile organic compounds, what, what are those typically is uh, in typical house paint, what, uh, 
what are the chemicals that are those volatile organic compounds if you know what I'm, I'm not great at naming chemicals but yeah. Um, yeah. VOCs as you said stands for volatile organic compounds and basically what that means is the rubbish that's oozing out of products that you own uh, now this could be paints which are uh, you know well known for having chemicals in it uh, but it could also be furniture and, and things with plastic coatings on right. it. All, all that sort of stuff sort of oozes things into your environment. And so it's great to avoid those instead. So in terms of VOCs and what's allowed, it varied greatly per country, which is fascinating. Um, <laughs> last time I looked uh, in Australia, depending on what type of paint it is, the maximum allowable VOC at that time, I think, was 60 to 65 VOC. It's gram per liter or something. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, 60, 65. In Europe, it's 30, 35. So in Europe, it's already half than what's allowed here, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you go into your typical hardware store and you look at the typical brands that you find on a shelf there, they're also catching on to this whole, hey, hang on, people are interested in low VOC paints. So they come out with their own low VOC paint. But of course, that's open for interpretation, right? What yeah. they think is low, what we might think is low. So, you know, some brands, their low VOC paint is 18 VOC, which, you know, we wouldn't think is very low at all. So, um, yeah, the aim is to, to go as low as possible. And there are good paints that you can have access to now, top coats, undercoats, uh, which are low or no VOC, which is brilliant. <laughs> Um, they have good covering power. I do always warn everybody that, you know, of course, initially these chemicals went into the paint to do a job, right? They had a function to perform. Now they make the paint better, as in, I don't know, might have made them more washable, yeah. or more Dry chip fast. resistant or something when you bump into them with a chair by accident. Um, Right. And so by removing those chemicals, I would imagine that in terms of quality durability, we're taking a little bit of a step back, a very worthwhile step. And I think we should be doing that. But we should be mindful that we've got to look after this paint. You know, it might not give us the same sort of durability that we've been used to from our chemical filled paints over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so, but yeah, so there's, there's plenty of alternatives available. And so, you know, if somebody wants to use, for example, our shielding paint, it'd almost be a shame to put anything normal over the top. You know, you want to investigate, you know, those healthier alternatives. So uh, paint is an option to deal with the radio frequency radiation from transmitters. Mm. Um, because this paint is highly electrically conductive, it allows that radiation to basically be bounced back. Now, shielding is never 100% block. Yeah. Always something comes through, but you're trying to have your performance as high as possible. And that, that's something that irritates me greatly, that you know, there's cheaper alternatives than what we have out there. And the test reports, well, many of them are dodgy to start with where they generate them themselves. But it's so easy to misrepresent the findings of testing you could some, for example, you might read somewhere 99.99% shielding. Mm. Well, first of all, the, the, the lay person would think, well, that's nearly 100%, isn't it? What are we splitting hairs here? 99%, 99.99% is all the same, isn't it? No, massive difference. Yeah. But if somebody just gives you the frequency, they're not really telling you anything. They, they're telling you that they tested a whole heap of different frequencies. Some were easy to shield against, and some were very difficult to shield against. And the one that they, the easiest one to shield against, that's where they scored that. They're not telling you about how lousy they were everywhere else. They're just trying to make it look better than it is. And it's so easy to do that, especially when people don't know what they're looking at. So um, yeah, anyway, that, that's something I get irritated about. But yeah, you want the best quality shielding because you're trying to achieve a result and you're just not going to do that with a mediocre mediocre approach but the the shielding paint is a great solution that could be of course be painted internally or externally the idea is that you create a faraday's cage you can basically create a box yeah and um, so you do the walls you do the ceiling and create a box for you to be in yeah. now in an, in an existing home as the, the house is bigger and this paint is not cheap but then again uh, you know, it does last for a very long time and, and to shield a bedroom, um, you know, goodness, you, you might spend that money on supplements in a year or something. So um, in, in a big house, it is a larger expense to shield the whole house. Um, 
So sometimes people choose to focus on the bedrooms as they are the most important and it's a, you know, also a justifiable approach. However, of course, in a smaller build, if you're just putting an extension on the house, or if you're building a tiny home, I mean, because it's so small anyway, you know, you're gonna have less roof materials, you're gonna have less timber, less electrics. And so to shield the sleeping environment, easy, but you know, if you wanted to shield the entire project, not that big a difference either. So it's, it's you know, as you use less materials anyway, it's a perfect opportunity to do the entire environment. So you also enjoy it when you're there in the, in the living areas, not the bedroom sort of a thing. Um, so the, uh, the paint is just <coughs> applied. Anybody can do that. Seriously, a 10 year old could do it. Um, just paint, brushwork. You just need to understand how it works. And so yeah. normally in an existing house, I would argue you want to have a consultant in so they can guide you with that process. You can apply it yourself, but you just need to get the input. And so with a tiny house, when you're building, you just need to understand those principles and how to apply it. And that's what, what I teach in that course as well. An alternative to paint would be mesh, which is what that stuff is behind me. Mm. And so that mesh, of course, has bigger holes in it. So more radiation comes through, but it's still also very good with the shielding. And it's very easy to apply. So especially builders like applying that better than paint because uh, you basically staple it into place, you ground it and, uh, and it works for you. And yeah, again, outside of the framework or inside with you on the framework, different ways of doing it. Um, and then basically paint or mesh, it can be grounded. So to make our way back to the electric fields we were talking about, um, because it's grounded, that's where electric fields want to be. Mm. And so that leads the electric fields away. And there's one important distinction there is that if you have, let's say if this is your external walls, your, your bedroom is here, right? If you shield on the outside of your external walls with either paint or mesh and you ground that, mm. um, the wiring is on the inside with you. Mm. So unless it's shielded cable, that will bring that electric field still in the room. Yeah. With the grounding of shielding paint or mesh, you get benefit from electric fields being led away, but only if the paint is between you and the electrical wiring. That's why it still makes sense to use shielded cable anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just yeah, a little distinction. We want to make sure that everybody's, uh, everybody's clear on. So the mesh, um, because I've looked into the whole Faraday cage uh, concept, uh, typically it's uh, metals like lead, aluminium, silver, gold, I think. Oh, copper as well. You guys must have gone through a lot of different uh, research into whether you'd use one thing or over another. And I also, I often thought about how in the old days, um, lead paint was quite common, but I think there were some issues with that. So, so you'd be shielded, but then you'd be breathing like lead oxide or something like that. Yeah, and, and lead paint wouldn't have enough lead in it to actually make any difference. And there's just some lead in it. There's no effect on radio frequency radiation. But yeah, you're quite right. So there's different materials you could use to achieve that result. And don't worry, in the very, very, very early beginnings, you know, we also learned from our mistakes, you know, because we were looking at, you know, the long term effect on people. Um, and so, but it's, you know, uh, a long, long time ago now. So we, we've settled on graphite and carbon. And same stuff you find in pencils. Mm. Um, if you paint it on the wall, it's black. But if you scratch it with your fingernails, it goes shiny, just like a pencil. And um, yeah, it doesn't come in any other, in any uh, <laughs> easier colors. It's always black on account of the graphite and the carbon. But it's no big deal. It's like an undercoat. So you just paint over it, two, two layers of undercoat over the top, and the black is gone. And then you go over it with your favorite color, and you wouldn't even know it's there. Right. Um, but yeah, so yeah, different different options. With lead-based paint, just while we're talking about it, if you think your house is that old that it may have lead paint in it, the strategy is to not disturb it. Mm. As long as you don't disturb it, you're fine. So you don't want to sand a wall that might have lead-based paint on it. Mm. Um, it's best to talk to your local paint store and maybe get a test kit to see if that is what it is. Okay. Um... I think probably uh, the next thing we should talk about, since we've covered a few points, is, is to talk about how people can, you know, at least get some idea of, you know, uh, what sort of issues they may have in their house. Because uh, when I 
when I got this, uh, when I got the cornet, I uh, I went around, uh, I basically just turned it on, and then the most the most fancy, the fancy the thing that seemed to show a lot is uh, the the sort of milli what is it milli milliwatts to uh, square meters. Look at that, it's all showing red near my computer. <laughs> Maybe could you talk a little bit about um, how those devices work and what are they what are they reading? Because I think there was three different there's three different um, metrics on there. So maybe yeah. we'll talk a little bit about the, the device and how how someone could at least use it just to see what they're initially what they're uh, they're they're looking at in terms of exposure. Yeah, sure. So um, th there's there's lots of meters available and if you go to eBay or Amazon or just look on Google um, if you type in the word EMF meter then a whole herd of meters will be presented to you yeah. um, I would always sort of argue that it's better to buy a meter from a, a company that that actually uses them or, or, or you know is a professional in this area so if you have a question you can ask something um, so you know faceless eBay faceless um, uh, Amazon might not be the, the, the best location to buy this. But anyway, so it, it's an EMF meter you're purchasing. Now you can buy those from $30 and, and dearer. And so the first thing I'd, I'd love to reinforce with people, uh, you get what you pay for, right? Um, I uh, I'm, <laughs> cut it over there. I don't really want to show it. I don't want to bag a brand, but I've, I've got an EMF meter I just purchased because I wanted to have a play with it. It was $30 on eBay. And this meter just measures magnetic fields, just from you know power running through power lines and, and transmission lines, that sort of stuff. When it comes to magnetic fields, the government exposure limit, what you're allowed to be exposed to in a residential setting by your government, chances are when in Australia it's a thousand milligauss. Same thing in, in the United States. In Canada, it's 833 milligauss. In Germany, it's higher. It varies a bit, but typically it's around a thousand milligauss. Now, um, when it comes to radio frequency, or sorry, when it comes to magnetic field exposure, um, a lot of research indicates that at four milligauss in streets where that's prevalent, we have an increased amount of childhood leukemia. Multiple studies show that. Um, from two milligauss and up, we have research that indicates that melatonin, which is a hormone that peaks at night when you go to sleep, is sort of your cleanup crew when you're sleeping. Um, melatonin is affected in its natural anti-cancer action at two milligauss and up. Remember, the, th the government limit is close to a thousand uh, in most countries. So two milligauss, we have a link with cancer already. At 1.6 milligauss, there's a doubling of the chances of sperm abnormalities. That's why you don't ever want to put your cell phone in your pocket, mm. right? I mean, radio frequency radiation is bad, but it is an electrical device. There will be a magnetic field. You don't want that anywhere near your reproductive material and, and really try and uh, get that mindset in your, ch in your children. It just lives, if it needs to move that phone, hold it in your hand and carry it, right? Mm. Don't stick it in your pocket. Um, or even in your backpack, I, said, I suppose. Sorry, again. In your in your backpack or your bag, will that? Yeah, yeah. Any any distance is good. And and mm -hmm. I don't know. Just somebody brought this up a little while ago, and I thought, how brilliant is that? If if you're just checking messages, right? Because a lot of people that don't necessarily do voice calls, everybody gets so many messages. Why don't you just put it on flight mode, which means it doesn't communicate, doesn't use radio frequency radiation. Um, and when you put it out of your bag or wherever you've got it then turn it off flight mode let the messages fly in as it takes a second anyway and there you are right why do they need to be able to come in all the time when you're not looking at your phone when you can just make them come in when you're looking at them mm. great idea anyway um, and by the way you don't have to use wi-fi you can you can buy adapters so you can get a, a, a um, uh, an internet cable from your router into your phone. Your internet is so much faster using really? a cable, really? so that's normally what motivates children. Oh, but wow. you can you can buy you can make an iPad work on it. You can make a smartphone work on a cable, and you just turn on flight mode, plug the thing in, and, and you're in business. Hmm. And if you think, well, hang on, then nobody can call me. Well, just divert your 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 number to your landline when you're home. We can ring on that. But anyway, um, 
what were we talking about? <laughs> well, we were talking about the various levels. Uh, now you said get the Gauss. So Gauss is is what's uh, measuring magnetic fields. Is that right, or is it electrical fields? Yeah, it's like the strength of magnetic fields, flux right. density. Right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You so milli Gauss. Milli Gauss is what we normally talk about. So it's a thousandth of a Gauss. Um, and so yeah, I was talking about the one point six doubles the chance of sperm abnormalities. And uh, I guess the most concerning research showed that um, kids who had leukemia uh, or have leukemia, and it was a decent study. I think there were like 600 kids with leukemia that were looked at and there was a control group. Um, if they were exposed to between one and two milligauss, government limit a thousand, right? One and two milligauss, their mortality rate yeah, I know, that's nasty. How many of these kids didn't survive? Their mortality rate was 260% higher if they were exposed to between 1 and 2 milligauss. So we were talking about meters. And so this cheap meter, this is where I was going with this, this cheap meter, $30, if I turn that on, it'll read zero until I'm exposed to over four milligauss, then it'll actually start indicating anything. Right. So what I'm getting at is that if you're going to buy a meter to give you some information, mm. you, you need this information to be valuable, right? So please don't look at any meter that you pay, you know, I mean, anything under $200 Australian or anything under $150 US um, or $140 US, I would be dubious of, 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 you have to be very, there might be some reasonable stuff, but there's a good chance that it's not so good. Um, so it's okay to spend a little bit more, right? Um, and so then you get something that's reasonable. Now, uh, you've got that Cornet meter, which is a very popular meter. Yeah. Um, for this area, we distribute that, which is, uh, which is nice for us. Um, we also have the Trifield meter, which we distribute. Um, both of those are sort of, you know, well-accepted, nice amateur meters. Now, of course, it's going to be different than a professional walking in with their tool case, right? Yeah. If, if a consultant yeah. um, like myself or one of my consultants comes in or other people, they'll probably come into your house with $5,000 to $10,000 worth of equipment. So there's going to be some limitations. I'm going to try and, and, and sort of explain what that is. So when you get an amateur meter, you know what you need to realize when you're looking at the numbers. All right. So... Um, you've got this cornet meter and uh, it's a cute little meter. It's lightweight, has a nine volt battery you can replace yourself. It has backlighting, there's audio you can turn on. Um, it measures those three radiation types that we were talking about. So it has magnetic field, electric field and radio frequency radiation. Mm. Now magnetic field, it only does on one axis. And I've got to explain that real quick. So when you have, let's say a cable, Right, and there's a magnetic field that goes around. It's a little bit like a whirlwind. So this magnetic field has a direction. It could be like this. Mm. It could be on an angle like this. Mm. It could be flat like this. It could be vertical like this, right? All these different ways. Mm. So if you have a field that goes like this and the sensor in your meter is positioned exactly in the wrong direction, you could have a strong magnetic field and your meter reads zero doesn't pick it up and so you know they came up with something clever what you could do you could put three sensors in it mm. and that's called a triple axis meter or a three axis meter and it basically measures those three planes all at the same time applies a mathematical formula and then you get the actual exposure mm. so the cornet its strength is radio frequency radiation but when it comes to magnetic fields, it only does one axis. Mm. So you, it, you know, it requires a lot of twisting and turning and then a bit of mathematics to sort of get mm. consistent, proper data out of it all the time, which is a bit of a pain in the bum if you're trying to assess every place in somebody's lounge room, you know, this side of the couch, that side of the couch, where a triple axis meter, you could basically slide it along and it would give a nice reading wherever you're looking at it. So. That, that's, let's say, a minus point of this. So I would say that this is great meter 
for investigating your radio frequency radiation exposure because that's really a strong suit. Yeah. All these amateur meters, there's always one thing they're excellent at and they're, they're good or okay with the other features. This one just excels in radio frequency radiation. Mm. So some of the features that this has is that it goes up to eight um, gigahertz, which is a, a quite a big radio frequency radiation range. Mm. It has a sensor in it that it can tell you what the predominant frequency is under 2.7 gigahertz, so you get a little number, which is interesting. Um, it remembers what the highest value is, what most of these meters do. Um, and what is sort of unique to this one is that it has a graph in it which sort of fills itself in as the exposure varies. Yeah. So what sometimes people, you know, people are electro hypersensitive, as in they can actually feel radiation. It's fascinating. Some of these people, they can hear radiation. You can drive them around town blindfolded and wow. they'll point out where the cell phone towers are because they can yeah. hear where this noise is coming from. Um, so sometimes, you know, they have a cornet running and they leave it running. And if they feel something odd or weird or, or they woke up in the middle of the night, they grab their meter and they look at that graph and you can sort of see what happened the last five minutes. Oh. Uh, and so you can maybe see that there was a spike of exposure. You know, this is sometimes interesting. The other thing which I do really like about the cornet is that it has this LED array on the side, these little yeah. lights you yeah. saw it on your meter before. Mm. Mm. So these things have different sensitivities, the lights. Mm. When you get it from the factory, it matches the exposure limit shown on the on the sticker on the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what that means is that um, you'll get green lights quite often, and when r exposure is absolutely horrific, then you start getting yellow and reds. So what we normally do before they leave here, when if people buy them from us, is that we go into the settings. Anybody can do this, but yeah. you can go into the settings and you can change that sensitivity. And what you should be doing is you should change it to the most sensitive setting. And then it, it doesn't sugarcoat it for you. When the levels are too high in relation to, you know, myself and other people in our industry, that's when it will indicate yellow when it's, you know, green's okay, yellow, things are starting to go bad, and red is, of course, atrocious. So we normally change the settings when our clients get them so they're already set like that. But you, you, you can change that. So it's a... It's, you know, as, as you pointed out to me, because we spoke, uh, you know, shortly after you got your media, it was quite confronting to just, like, it's like, there was almost no relief, right? It's, it's always red. And that's exactly the point. You know, our exposure is way too high, yeah. uh, especially for bedroom environments, should be addressed. Now, the difference between an amateur meter when it comes to radio frequency radiation and a professional level meter might be that the professional meter, which is, for example, the instrumentation I use, allows you to measure what the body actually absorbs mm. because this thing only has a small antenna in it but the um you know um the body is a much bigger antenna mm. and and we know this as well right when if you're if, you, <laughs> if you're not 10 20 or, <laughs> or or maybe 30 now we're getting older um you know when you had the old tube style television with the bunny ears on the top Right, the picture would go lousy, and you send somebody over to adjust the bunny ears. Yeah. As long as they were holding on to it, you had a great picture, didn't you? Yeah. Right, and you say, yeah, 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 like that, and they'd walk away, and then the, sh <laughs> the picture would go rubbish again, and you'd laugh. You know, stay there, keep holding on to it. Yeah. Right, your body is a big antenna, mm. and so, and that's something we identified professionally that sometimes if you measure the air. And an air measurement says that the radiation exposure is acceptable. If you did a body measurement instead, it may still show that your body's under stress and it should still be mitigated. So an, an air measuring meter is great to find sources of radiation. It's great to highlight, you, this is not good enough, you should do something about it. Yeah. But if it gives you a low reading, it may not necessarily mean it's good enough. And so a professional assessment is often still a good idea. Um, but anyway, so let, let's talk some numbers so we all know what to do with it. And the, the yeah. same thing goes for this TF2 from Alpha Lab, mm. which is a, a meter that measures radio frequency radiation up to 6 gigahertz. So its window is a little bit smaller for radio frequency radiation. It doesn't have that graph. It doesn't have the LED lights. Mm. But when it comes to magnetic fields, this measures in three axes. Okay. So that's okay. its strength, strong suit. So 
if you're interested in your exposure, what you have right now, and you're particularly interested in radio frequency radiation, your coronet is more feature rich. If you're looking to purchase a block of land, mm. if you're looking at buying a house, I would think your TF2 is your better choice because the magnetic fields can't be fixed, can't be shielded against most of the time. So you need to know that information as best as you can get it. And this in magnetic fields comes very close to our professional meter. It's quite impressive you know, for us. But anyway, so when it comes to radio frequency radiation, measuring in the air, most of these meters, Here's another little one, also pretty good. That's a TM190. Mm. Um, most of these meters will measure in milliwatts per square meter. Yeah. Now, yeah. our industry, we actually typically talk about microwatts per square meter. Mm. Uh, and most of the research talks about that unit of measurement as well. So the difference, milli is a thousandst micro is the next step in other three zero that's millionth so when it comes to um, radio frequency radiation 10 microwatts per square meter and higher up to a thousand is where severe exposure sits and it's less than that is slight exposure is this micro or milli milliwatts oh, this is so what that means is that you've got a zero a decimal yeah. point and then right. zero 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 right, right. That's, that's how it reads so if you want to know what 10 microwatts is on a cornet or on a tf2 it is 0 0.01 mm. that's where severe exposure begins wow, wow. now th that's the thing with these meters Anybody might look at the number and because it's so close to the lowest number, it can indicate you draw the conclusion, well, it's a low number, there's no problem. And there is enough problems. It's just you spend two, three hundred dollars on a meter instead of thousands. Uh, and that's why you can't go smaller. So that's the important thing to realize. If you're taking some measurements, if it reads 0 0.01 milliwatts per square meter, um, we would already be looking at mitigating and shielding that bedroom environment. Mm. Um, so with magnetic fields, one milligauss is where the bad news starts in terms of research. So we, we want to stay away from one, mm. right? And we don't want to get too close either. And magnetic fields, it varies throughout the day and it can vary you know, over the future, we might use more power in that suburb and then the usage will go up, magnetic fields will get stronger. Um, so in our industry, we normally say the value to shoot for is 0 0.3 milligauss in a bedroom environment. That's what you'd like to be. Mm. Now, let it be 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I wouldn't move house for it. But if it goes to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, now we're getting very close to that one and your buffer is getting smaller. So especially if you're looking at buying a piece of land or deciding which part of your house you're going to extend a bedroom onto. Mm. Well, if, if here you've got 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 milligauss and here you've got 0 0.9, maybe you want to build your house on that side. Mm. If you're looking at a place to put your tiny house, mm. right? If you can say, so, well, we're going to be here for six months, grab your meter out or where are we going to put this thing? Mm. Base it on some numbers instead of just picking a spot. Um, and the other thing that these meters do is electric fields, and that's tricky as well. Not once you know how to do it, but it's tricky to do it. Electric fields are attracted to ground, and the common building materials don't conduct very well, as in your timbers and your plasterboard or your rock. Um, so when you walk into a room, you're a bag of water, and you're sort of the next best thing. For electric fields if you could see them it'd be like arcing coming from the walls just latching onto your head and your shoulders um, and so if you hold a meter and you measure you've probably noticed this if you hold this meter and you set it on electric fields if you hold the meter the number goes up mm. right where if you put it on the table and you step back the number settles mm. right so um you attract the electric fields. Mm. So if you do an assessment for electric fields, you should do it without you touching it. Mm. 
if we do it professionally, we actually want to measure your body and we use special instrumentation to measure your body instead. But if you're using one of these meters, you want to do it without touching it. Mm. And so you want to set it up, you want to put it there, basically extend as far away as you can stand and still being able to read the numbers mm. and then see what you're exposed to. Put it on your bedside table, put it on your pillow, the other people, pillow, sorry, the ends of the bed and see what sort of numbers you're getting. Between going off memory here, 1.5 volts per meter and um, 0 0.3 volts per meter is slight concern. Now 0 0.3 is very close. Or so I, I think both of these meters, they can only indicate 0 or 1. So it's, it's, it's too fine already to sort of distinguish within that range. But I would indicate that if, if you see 1 volt per meter on these meters, when you just park them somewhere and stand back, um, then yeah. again, it's, it's electric fields we need to mitigate. Again, 95% of bedrooms have that problem. Um, so is that um, no, yeah, sort of good the, enough in terms of good, using but, the meter? Um, I, I keep thinking well about the, how so far you've said that there's not really much you can really do about magnetic fields. It seems like the only thing you can really do is kind of move away, move away from a magnetic field. But so is that, is that that's the option so if you've got a if you're exposed to magnetic fields there's really not much you can really do yeah well it, it, distance decreases them so in an existing house if you're in the master bedroom up the front you're battling cancer fertility issues or chronic health issues and you measure in that bedroom and you've got a reading which isn't great but you might have a spare bedroom on the other end of the house yeah you might have very different bedrooms and i would argue move yeah. Right. Just, yeah. I mean, for starters, just move bedrooms yeah, yeah. based yeah. on your readings. Um, if you and, and especially intersections are always worse. Right. So if you're on a corner property and the local distribution line goes past your house on one side, but then also past one of the other side, you get two magnetic fields. And so those magnetic fields last longer, deeper into your property. That's always troublesome. Um, but if you have magnetic fields that are coming from the street, and you can't do anything about it. Mm. It's, it's an incredibly remote possibility, but it has happened. It, if it is excessive, mm. um, especially with maybe the input of a prof professional, if you approach the power company, it can be that they have a hardware problem. Mm. And I have had clients where, you know, most of the time, if you ring the power company and you start talking about radiation, you know, they roll their eyes, <laughs> I would imagine, on the phone, right? And they wouldn't want to talk to you because the government limit is a thousand milligauss. What are you worried about with your seven milligauss? Um, but a lot of those people that work there, they also know better, right? Because they work with this stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. Um, you may get a sympathetic ear, right? They may send out a team to have a look at their hardware. And it has happened where... Um, you know, they, uh, they've investigated something, some transformer up the road had a problem, they fixed it, and the whole street got better because of it. Mm. But this is, this is rare sort of stuff that, that happens. And often the magnetic fields that are there are just because they're there and everything is working optimally. So uh, it depends a little bit on the situation. So again, if a professional sort of came to double check your measurements, yeah. Um, yeah. then you probably have a little bit more um, sort of, you know, weight to bring to the discussion yeah because i uh look i look out at the front of my house which has uh, the you know the power lines and then i think i do contemplate about the like you said the, the master bedroom so yeah that could be an issue but uh you're saying you're saying this device i should be able to at least see if it's measuring one if it's measuring one um then that's a, a concern really right yeah, well, especially especially this because it only measures on one axis. Yeah. If you see one, yeah, the way you're holding it, yeah, chances are is that you also get on the other planes you also get some exposure. Yeah. So the number will actually be a little bit higher than one. Mm. Um, so yeah, you, basically, I mean, there's a mathematical formula for it, but basically you want to hold it one way, mm. second way, third way. Yeah. Then you've got three numbers. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the cheats way of doing it is that you take the highest number and you, you apply half mm -hmm. of the second highest value that you've measured. Okay. 
okay. and then you sort of ballpark figure in in the area where the formula would have what the formula would have told you as I, I suppose the thing they should also talk about is uh is you know the whole 5g thing because we were talking about it yesterday and there's a extreme amount of confusion about 5g and and what what's the what's the real risk because you've got you know one side saying there's you know like governments and corporations that are saying there's no risk and then there's a lot of other people that have been reading a lot of those studies that you talk about and say that there is a risk and i think what's all, what's particularly also particularly confusing as i was saying on the on the modems some of the the modems that i've seen is it it'll have the wi-fi will read one thing and then it'll have so it'll have a say telstra xx and then I have Telstra XXX dash five, and it's it's a bit misleading um, about that the the five G itself, and maybe that's an accidental or deliberate or whatever, but it's still quite confounding because five G really just means for most people it's just the fifth generation of of uh, the cell phone uh, technology, whereas on the mode on the modem it's like you were saying it's it's the I think it's 2.4 gigahertz versus uh, five gigahertz. So I think that there's a concern, but I think the the thing is it's the level of gigahertz that seems to be the big concern. But I'm I'm still a bit unsure about what what actually the gigahertz means in terms of um, uh, the hazard to human health. Yeah. So. With, with the, the phone network, so we have all these different networks. And at some point, they started na numbering them. Of course, they had many different networks before them. So we might be talking about the third, the fourth, and the fifth generation. But it's probably more likely like the 10th and the 12th. But um, every two years, they seem to come out with something new, right? And they rarely turn off the old stuff, right? So they just keep adding things to it. So we have a lot of studies or not not a lot but we have studies about 3g and 4g and yeah same old story right if this study is is paid for by the telecommunications industry it doesn't tend to find that there's a problem if it's an independent finance studies um, then these studies do show that there's a problem so anyway as I mentioned there's about 10,000 plus peer-reviewed research studies showing that there is harm all right, so with 3G and 4G, we have some research. We know that this is bad for us. With 5G, there's just no research, right? And then it's a little bit the same as chemicals, right? You can you could test the the effect of one chemical and say, oh, this is safe, but our environment is so filled with all these other chemicals, there's there's no normal anymore, right? There, there's no um, there's, <laughs> there's no comparison to be made with a clean environment. So we have no idea what one chemical would do with, together with other chemicals. And so the exact same thing with radio frequency radiation. So we have a 3G, a 4G, or all these other networks. Um, and then we have 5G now coming in. There's no tests on it if it's safe, right? And that's the argument with it. And, and rightly so, I heard somebody uh, you know, say this week that you know, some people say, well, you know, there's all this concern about 5G. It's fear mongering. No, 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 no. Asking for somebody to have scientific research data that this stuff is safe. That's not fear mongering. That's just common sense. Um, so we don't know what 5G is going to do, but at the very least, it would have to be just as bad as what we already have. And then we'll have more of it. Mm. Now, there's every um, uh, anticipation that 5G will be worse, which makes perfect sense because 5G uses a higher frequency, they want to have multiple connections to your phone. There's less penetrating depth with the signal against your building materials, concrete walls, that sort of stuff. So they need more transmitters. And that's why you know some countries are boasting, oh, we'll have a transmitter on the corner of every street. You know, they'll put them on the street lights. Um, so they're gonna have more antennas, more signals, multiple connections to your phone. So it'll be just be more intense exposure. Then the thing people have to realize as well is that the towers talk to your phone, right? That requires a particular frequency. But there might be that this cell phone tower is talking to a thousand cell phones in the area, right? And I don't know, I'm making this stuff up, of course. Let's say 600 people are watching a YouTube video, right? And so all this data is being communicated at a frequency to the tower. 
But this tower needs to get that all that information from somewhere else. Right now, a lot of towers, they have power connected to them, but not data. Right? They don't have an internet supply to each cable. Right? I mean, just drive around the countryside, you see some sort of lonely phone tower on top of a mountain. Right? They run power up there to make it work, but they didn't run data up there. That's why you see those round dishes hanging on phone towers. This, these are directional transmitters. And this uses higher frequencies, and that's how it communicates the information from one tower to the next, and the next, and the next. And so they use different frequencies. So they might say, I've got this much information to send within a, within a second. Half of that is going to go on this frequency. This chunk is going to go on that frequency. This chunk is going to go on this slower frequency. And this little bit is going on this lowest frequency. And a second or a split second later, it all arrives at the same time on the other end. It's a little bit like downloading three files on your computer. You see all those graphs going to fully loaded, right? And they're basically the information is packed together again, and then it goes to the next tower. So we need higher frequencies to move more and more of the data. Now, those frequencies were already high, but now because they anticipate moving, having to move more and more and more data faster, 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 those frequencies need to go up. And so 30, 40, 50 gigahertz is now being used. And higher frequencies are typically linked to damaging the finer organs, like eyes, um, brain, those sorts of things. Um, and it's, yeah, we can go on about this for hours. But, yeah. you know, when you go to the airport and you now have those, those vision, those body scanners that zip, zip around you and they get an outline of what you're carrying on your person. Right? And it's, oh, don't worry. And they'll, they'll avoid any word but radiation, right? It'll, it'll be an energy wave, a millimeter wave. It is radiation, but they just don't want to use that word, right? And so, oh, it's only, it only penetrates a few millimeters. Well, I, I like the first millimeters of my eyeballs. How about you, right? So if you <laughs> try to get to opt out, say, can you pat me down instead? I don't want to go through this thing. Mm. But if you're forced to go through, in Australia, it's, it's, it's shameful that we are one of two countries in the world that actually have a bullying tactic in place. If you refuse to go through one of those body scanners when selected to go through, um, you will then be blocked from entering the airport for 24 hours and you can come back tomorrow and then we'll give you a pat down. They could do just as well easy today, the same amount of work, but you're just being bullying, trying to get you to, to, to give in anyway. But anyway, so if you want to get on your flight and you have to go through those scanners and they won't let you out of it, um, just keep your eyeballs, keep your eyes closed until they call you to come out. Just protect those uh, those eyeballs. Um, anyway, so we have these higher frequencies, and then with 5G, one of the frequencies that they're using is 60 gigahertz. Now there is research on that, which indicates that um, it mucks around with our um, our blood's ability to uptake oxygen. Mm. Um, and so, of course, that that's a terrible idea. Now. <coughs> Um, you know, did they do that on purpose? I doubt it. You know, uh, who, who wants to damage and harm and kill their customers, right? Uh, maybe it was an oversight. Maybe they just don't care and they've never looked at it. Um, but, you know, those sorts of frequencies are, of course, bad to use. And, you know, the other ones just add to the burden. So, yeah, we don't have any data on 5G. It's safe to assume it's just going to be more of more bad stuff. And so, yeah, uh, we, we shouldn't have it really. Uh, but it's here, it's coming, and they're already working on 6G and others that just keep going. So the good news in this, I mean, that's not good news, but the, the thing to, you know, to realize, no need to be paranoid about it either. Just realize that it is your sleep time that matters most. That's where your body rebuilds yeah. you know, the damage that you've had that day and prepares you for the day that's ahead. And that's why that bedroom is so important. Your bedroom should be perfect yeah. despite your daytime exposure. And so, you know, if we can help people with that in their existing houses or in the building projects when they're making a tiny house, fantastic. Um, that's, uh, that's what we love doing. And that's, that's the next thing that uh, is coming up as you've got this tiny, tiny house course where you're going to incorporate all of the, all of the different, uh, into that and I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah, basically everything we spoke about, we'll look at the different radiation types 
I'll show you how to use professional meters and amateur meters. So no matter what your budget is, mm. um, you know, whatever you end up you know, getting to give you some guidance in terms of meters, you'll be able to understand it, wield it and, and use it with confidence. Um, we'll talk about the different radiation types. We'll look at uh, building planning. So looking at a, a building plan. Um, my intention is to do a number of live versions of this course. There'll be self-guided versions of this course you can do on the internet on your own pace. There'll be other ones where we have set sort of dates where we meet online, like we're doing now, mm. and discuss possibly the building plans of, of an individual that is also available. Um, and, but we'll teach you how to look at those building plans, knowing what the problems are, to sort of anticipate where we can see to get problems and then how to avoid those. We'll go over the shielding solutions or the avoidance strategies so you know about those. Um, and then we also want to go into how to actually implement them. So if, you know, if you're building a tiny house and you're standing there, you've got the tools, you've got that mesh ready to go, you've got the tools in hand, you know, I want you to, be, to feel confident to put this stuff in place. It's not difficult, but something being not difficult and you feeling confident you're doing the right thing, that's quite two different things. So all that sort of stuff is all packed into that course. And so I think people will get you know, a lot more content than they would ever imagined um, you know, having, having gotten into it. So I'm, I'm really excited and passionate about it because you know, especially in a small construction, you know, it's just such, you know, it's not a big expense in contrast to the cost of the, the project to, to make these small adjustments and, and make it something truly special. And um, I mean, this uh, tiny home that you're talking about is one of the typical tiny homes on a, on a trailer. I suppose at some point there could be a, uh, I mean, a, you could incorporate it into a, a permanent structure. Um, is that also something that uh, your group would look at doing? doing? Yeah, we, in, in, the, in the tiny house sort of extensions course, we, we're sort of keeping the examples based on tiny house and, 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 and extensions, but the principles apply exactly to larger building projects as well. So um, the intention is that we'll soon have a course um, also available, which is going to be more comprehensive and also be available for professionals, for consultants that want to go more into this building side of things. Uh, so we'll probably have two levels. So the, the amateur for tiny homes and extensions, and uh, then the, the more comprehensive course will come a little later. Sounds good. Um, now I, I did uh, that hemp house uh, video you guys did a while back was pretty good in terms of showing a lot of things we've talked about today. Um, have you got any other uh, videos that you'd recommend um, people look at in terms of showing how uh, houses uh, are put together? Yeah, we've got quite a few. So I think the easiest thing is to just put some uh, some links in the description uh, with this video um, for people to uh, to click on. So that, the, the one you mentioned, the hemp home, is brilliant. It's really so you good. You see some of the before, some of the after. And then what we love doing is that we can measure somebody's body, which is you know, arguably the more nitpicky way of measuring, um, put them outside and then yeah. let them walk yeah. inside. And it's exactly what you see uh, yeah, Steve Hewitt do is in that video. And uh, you see the levels go from mid five, 6,000 microvolts, which is uh, different than what we talked about because it's a body measurement, it's different. Um, and it goes to an incredibly low number. You're gonna have to, have to go and have a look. Um, there's a video about whole house shielding Okay. And we'll put the link in that as well. There's a cool video about us being involved with some apartment buildings. Um, yeah, there's an ever increasing sort of amount. Uh, people can go to uh, the, the websites that we have. I'll put the, the link into, uh, uh, into the description as well. And um, yeah, there's lots of information to be found. And uh, as I mentioned, I've got a podcast channel called Health Stronghold. Okay. Uh, so you can find that on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, all that other stuff. Um, and I have okay. a website of my own um, to sort of support that podcast, also called healthstronghold.com. Mm. Um, there's lots of information there as well. Seeing a uh, course comes together and, uh, and its various uh, iterations after. So thanks a lot and uh, have a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody uh, got lots out of this. And if you want to know more, just, uh, you know, just uh, dig a little deeper, listen to some interviews, read some articles. And uh, yeah, if we can, you know, if we can help you with training or an assessment, we'd be delighted to do so. So thank you very much for your time.
Thank you as well. See you later. Bye. All right. Thanks.